Amen, amen. Grace and peace. We bless God for each and every one of you that have joined us in Bible study tonight. I don't know, maybe I didn't get the memo that Bible study was canceled. Amen. So if you see somebody uh, that I might have left out, I'm trying all of this new technology and stuff like that. So there are some individuals that I may have left out here and there. Amen. So I need y'all to cover me like somebody Go ahead and tag Mother Simpson. I see that uh, we didn't get her in on tonight and I'm missing a few names. I'm just trying to work uh, these things out and become a little more technologically sophisticated, uh, you know, overall. But we certainly bless God for each of you, for those of you that are each dropping in on our Bible studies on tonight. I hope you got pen and paper, amen. Um, but let me give you my biography for a reason, because uh, tonight we're going to deal with, uh, you know, week number, well, we're actually in week number 16 uh, in our faith and finance series. My name is Reverend Dr. Nicole B. Simpson. I am the senior pastor at Micah 7 Ministries, and we have been addressing a topic to help us all get our financial affairs in order by vocation. Well, let me start off by education first, by education in terms of theology and pastoring, because we deal with real life issues from a biblical perspective. We're teaching financial principles according and consistent with the word of God. So I think it's important in this, um, you know, to, in this area. Yes, while I have been called to preach the gospel, I am also, uh, you know, one that received my bachelor's of science from Oral Roberts University in church ministries. I then pursued my doctor. Um, my Master's of Divinity, and I received that from uh, New Brunswick Theological Seminary, and I completed my doctorate in transformational leadership in Boston University. And so uh, that is my educational background that's consistent with my theological call uh, uh, overall. Um, but because we're dealing with faith and finances, uh, my uh, vocational background is equally as important in this context. See, the first set of what it is I accomplished deals with the REV in the front of my name. Uh, the latter part in the finances deal with the CFP part of my name. And so in terms of that, I am a um, an individual that's been in the securities industry for 29 years and counting. I have not only my Series 7, I have my Series 63, my Series 65. I have my life and health insurance as well. And for the last 19 of the 29 years, I also have my CFP designation. If that's not enough, I did have my commodities license, which is a series three where you trade hard assets uh, like, um, you know, gold and silver and metallics, grain, oil, and things of that nature. But when I knew that I was going into comprehensive financial planning, um, I um, allowed that to lapse based off of some of the choices that I made in terms of my career or my vocation. So now that we've got that in the way, you know, I also want to give you one housekeeping item that I think is very important. Uh, you know, I have a YouTube channel um, and I'm going to ask, um, Someone to put it up. It's Nicole B. It's YouTube.com um, forward slash Nicole B. Simpson. All of the Faith and Finance series is found, guess where? On my YouTube channel. So if you miss any of the weeks, any of the weeks, uh, please feel free to go ahead and check it out. And you can start with Faith and Finances from week one all the way up to week 16. This 
one is being recorded live on YouTube as we speak right now. And so we are really trying to ensure that technologically speaking, we are meeting the needs of the 21st century. While we have always been uh, individuals that have streamed online all of the sermons, we've been giving people more than what it is uh, that they have received in the past. In addition to these 16 weeks, if you go back, I was sort of looking at some of the footage as we have been preparing and I've been trying to aptly title them and word them or what have you. If you go back, you will see that there is um, information available that um, deals with all facets of finances from years ago. And if you really care, you'll see some of my historical interviews and um, such while I used to um, be out there as a um, media personality for the power of gospel. Some of my more notable uh, radio and television interviews are also on there. And so I think that you will find that to be most enjoyable. Now, having said all of that, we have gotten to our part. Uh, for those of you that have been um, following along, I, I have not spoken about this in probably about four weeks, but the partner or the uh, you know, the book that we have been utilizing has been The Richest Man in Babylon. Uh, and yes, we are nearing the end of it, but I wanted to deviate just a little bit because there were some things that I wanted to elaborate or expound upon overall. But there were seven cures in The Richest Man in Babylon. Today's cure is the seventh cure, meaning seven ways how one is um, able of accumulating wealth. If this is what you so desire, your ability to accumulate or acquire wealth. Uh, uh, this book has shown people through the richest man in Babylon how to acquire such a thing. Uh, and so we've been going through them very steadily uh, as I've seen fit. I have expounded upon or elaborated on these things a little more intensely than, um, you know, one lesson versus another. And so I did want to spend a significant amount of time on um, retirement and life insurance. And then at the same time, my book was released. And so you saw me doing some of those things that dealt with faith and finances as being one of the presenters at other people's Bible studies. And while that may come up again, uh, moving forward, uh, overall, it has expanded our book choice, uh, you know, or, or our engagement or involvement with the book. And so um, the seven cures, because we're on the seventh one tonight, the first one was to start thy purse to fatten in. And so we went over really how to get started saving and investing. The second one was controlling thy expenditures. I'm just going over very quickly. They're in those 16 weeks if you want to take a look at them. Controlling thy expenditures. That was uh, ensuring that you had a, a budget and you have proper money manage of what it is that you're bringing in versus what it is that is going out. How do you maintain that? I have shared with you that I subscribe personally to the 10, 10, 80 method. Uh, you know, there are some that have added and taken away from that, uh, um, but I've been adhering to that principle for almost the same 30 years uh, that I have been in dialogue uh, uh, or in business doing this all over overall. Make that goal to multiply was the third one. Meaning, uh, you know, there's this difference between saving and uh, some level of investments. And so I kind of went through that as well. Guarding thy treasures from loss, using wisdom. I mean, we really delved into, uh, you know, dealing with and addressing wisdom, you know, recognizing who it is that you should be working with uh, when it comes to you acquiring and or accumulating wealth. You do not want to take all of your wealth to a mechanic unless you are going into an auto mechanic business with the mechanic and you are the financier. See how that works. But if you're trying to acquire wealth and not through business, you want to use someone uh, uh, that with that level of expertise uh, so that they are able to guard your treasure from loss. Make thy dwelling a profitable investment. We talked about the significance and the emotional 
value of having some level of real estate home ownership, a place of stability for you and your household overall. Number six was ensuring a future income. And that's really where, uh, you know, I wanted to take a turn and take my time, you know, because I wanted you to really understand the significance between uh, saving for retirement and also ensuring that you had some level of life insurance or insurance uh, to protect and provide for your family. These things are critical in terms of savings and investing. But tonight, somebody say tonight, but tonight is really, really important because tonight deals with you. And this is probably a great introduction uh, into uh, the ultimate plan, a financial survival guide for life's unexpected events, or I haven't figured out there to dream yet, whichever one, but it's going to be one of my books because I've dealt with this overall. But, um, you know, one of the things that we have to learn in today's day and age uh, is how to ensure that you are investing overall, you know, and so we want to make sure that we are doing all of the right things financially speaking. So tonight I am actually going to delve into, this is why I said, uh, I hope that you have pen and paper because I'm going to delve into the significance of, of being an entrepreneur. See, we have been uh, teasing, I have been uh, dipping my toe in the water, I have been addressing, uh, you know, how important it is uh, to have what is your own. And you know, uh, I have also in uh, the depths of who it is that I am and what you know me to do. I've been addressing that, but I want you to understand that if you really want to acquire wealth, if you really want to acquire wealth, there are certain things, certain lessons that you must know that are critical for your success. The seventh cure is probably the one that is uh, most important and most uh, notable to me. It is something that you uh, should recognize uh, uh, overall because it will help you uh, to make sure that you are not only acquiring a higher level of income, but you are setting yourself up in an area or a level of expertise. The seventh cure is to increase thy ability to earn. If we look at the book, we understand that, uh, you know, the one that has been telling uh, this particular uh, story, uh, uh, Armad has basically said uh, someone had come up to him and asked him, uh, you better pay attention to this real clearly, uh, uh, asked him, could he borrow some money? Now, we all can identify with somebody asking, could they borrow some money? And uh, uh, instead of just giving the money immediately, one of the things that he wanted to do uh, is to make the determination as to why do you need to borrow? Because see, here's the thing about lending and borrowing money overall. As the borrower, that means whatever it is that you have, if you've done all of these other areas, all these other things in your life, uh, then uh, the you will always come up short in whatever it is that you're doing. You're living from a place of loss, which means uh, you will perpetually rob Peter to pay Paul. Anybody ever hear that saying before? I had to rob Peter to pay Paul. And so after a while, after that vicious cycle, it might be one, three, five, 10, 20 years, uh, there has to come a point in your life where you realize uh, that robbing Peter to pay Paul is not a fruitful endeavor and will not get you where it is uh, that you're looking to go overall. Can I get an amen? Does somebody agree with what it is that I am saying? And so if you don't want to be in that place uh, where you're robbing Peter to pay Paul, uh, then you must do something to increase your earnings potential, uh, your ability to earn money. Uh, let me take you to the word first of all, because uh, I think it's important uh, for us to recognize the biblical principle that is associated uh, with earning a higher level of income. But I want to start off because the author actually says something that I think is invaluable. He says preceding accomplishment must be desires and your desires must be strong and they must be definite. And so what he's saying is uh, you must desire to have wealth. You must desire to earn more. And so that makes me think, well, when I think about desires, what am I saying? I think that's a very important question. So, of course, we go to uh, 
the um, dictionary to sort of look at what is a desire. Now, desires can get you in trouble. Desires, whoo, Jesus, they can get you in trouble. Some desires are good and some are, are biblically sound. So we got to make sure we know where it is that we're landing overall. But if we look at the Miriam dictionary for the word desire, desire means a, a strong feeling of wanting to have something or wishing for something to happen. Can I take it to the biblical text for a moment? because the biblical text is probably a tad bit more exhaustive in that nature. The word desire covers a huge or a wide range of human wants, their emotions, and their cravings. It can be described as natural desires, which might be a desire or include a hunger for food, sexual longings, and a desire for God. So it's interesting because the biblical text, you know, in terms of biblical definition, it tells you it could be a desire for food, it could be a sexual longing, and it could be a desire for God. Doesn't that just feel funny, right? It just feels all over the place. Uh, uh, but it can also describe unnatural desires or cravings, uh, which can include such things as greed and lust, right? So you got to know, how do I know if my desire is a good or a a bad desire. How do I know how to determine which is which in this, you know, this thing that I'm trying to have, this desire, you know, to earn or acquire wealth? Well, that has to be answered because uh, uh, we ne we need to know where it is that we are standing. Uh, the answer actually lies in uh, the object or the reason that you have for the desire. So let's put this back into financial context for a moment. Uh, what's your reason or your desire for Wealth. What is your purpose? What is the underlying yearning for it? Uh, see, people want to acquire desire or um, acquire wealth for a multitude of reasons, and so you have to determine where yours lie. I'm not here to judge you on your reason or rationale, because I'm going to be honest with you and tell you uh, where minds come from. Can I tell you where it is mine, mine come from? My desire comes from the fact that we grew up poor. And I was like, look, I don't want to be poor another day in my life again. So I'm going to work hard to do whatever it is that I need to do in order to ensure that I'm not going to be poor again. So whatever I have to do to make that money, and I almost feel like, you know, you're watching, a, a, you know, what Players Club, but don't let the money make you. My desire, you know, is toe in the middle of the line. I'm, I'm like, I'm middle of the line in terms of my desires. I don't want to be broke. I don't want to go back to the projects. I don't want to see the hood another day in my life unless I'm voluntarily going in for a day and voluntarily coming back out. The desire to acquire wealth was based off of my desire not to be broke another day in my life. And so was that what drove me to be able to do what it is that I do? We think about where it is that we're standing and what it is that God says. We can look at it from that context. So it may not be bad. I don't think that that's a bad uh, situation, uh, but it may not be, you know, the most optimal godly purpose or objective motive or intention either. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, uh, we'll find ourselves in a place uh, of finding a good sage middle ground. But when we think about desire and we look at it from a biblical text, even if we desire wealth, right? Because scripture does tell you, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. So there is no problem with prosperity. There's no problem with you desiring to be wealthy. There's no problem with your desire to provide for your family. None of those things are problematic in and of themselves. So many of us, because I am guilty as charged as well, when I think about the desires of a thing, the first scripture that almost always comes into mind is Psalm 34 and 4. And if you grew up like I did, right, King James Version, all day, every day, maybe before we got, you know, an expense of different um, texts and, and, and interpretations of, of the word of God. Psalm 34 and 4 says, if you delight thyself also in the Lord and he, well, delight thyself also in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. And so many people have misinterpreted this particular passage of scripture to the degree that uh, everything that I want from you, God, you won't give me because I'm delighting myself in you. And so the misinterpretation oftentimes come with uh, the delighting yourself in the Lord. 
So if we get to that place where we're saying, I delight myself in the Lord, that's why I'm going to get uh, the desires of my heart. And we don't have a true, uh, 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 a true understanding of what delighting yourself in the Lord means. Then whatever your desires of your heart is, uh, it may not be what it is that God has for you. And so as you mature, as you grow older in God, I mean, and, uh, you know, you, you've gotten to the place uh, where you know that it's not your will that you want done in your life. You want God's will to be done in your life. You want to know what it is that God purpose for you. Uh, so we go through this whole thing of identity. Uh, I'm not going to touch identity tonight. I think that on last year, the tail end of last year, uh, Dr. Holcomb did a phenomenal job in dealing with and or addressing identity pastor has talked about who it is that you are, what it is, uh, is your purpose or your calling or your anointing uh, overall. But when we delight ourselves in the Lord, uh, we are knowing exactly who it is that we are in the Kim. We find out who we are when we delight ourselves in the Lord. Uh, and so when we get to that place, knowing how we have been formed, how we have been shaped, how we have been defined by God puts in a different level of what our desires would be because in us spending and delighting ourselves, see delight desire, I want to make sure that you get clear, in our delighting ourselves in God, we're coming to a clearer understanding of who it is that we are and how it is that we have been made. That's some work right there. How it is that we've been made, how we've been shaped, how we've been formulated, what's good about us, what is our challenges, our levels of insecurities and our levels of strength. We know our weaknesses and we know all of these things about us that ought to be able to define us a little more effectively than we had been accustomed in the past. Once we find out who it is that we are, some of our desires should shift. It should shift to be more in alignment well, what God desires for us. See, we don't desire any longer anything that's absent from how God envisioned us. That's a beautiful place to be. See, now that I have delighted myself in the Lord and I know who it is that I am, I, I know the best me. Now, what am I using to justify this? I'm using Daniel. I want you to go to Daniel for a moment. Hallelujah, because I think Daniel really defines it, just the essence of who it is that Daniel was. He began to do different things, to be more in alignment with being God's vessel. And everything that Daniel did, Daniel did with a spirit of excellence. Now, I'm going to tell us to go to Daniel 5.12, but I'm going to give you a quick backdrop on Daniel. I'm not going to go in depth about him, but I would encourage you to read it if you get a free moment. But Daniel 5 and 12. When they, meaning uh, when uh, they were talking about Daniel, meaning the king, let me go ahead and give you some background exegesis so that y'all know that I gave y'all my whole, uh, you know, educational background uh, that it came from somewhere. So if we look at Daniel overall, we understand that um, and, and just go right to the fifth chapter uh, so that we understand King Belsh Belshazzar was at a festival. And while he was at the festival, they were having a really good time. And so uh, for those of you that do not know who Belshazzar is, uh, his father was King Nebuchadnezzar. And so Belshazzar is having a very good time. He's at, uh, you know, a feast at that time. I'm giving y'all a paraphrase. Y'all go ahead and check it out for yourself. And while they're in the middle of the feast, the wine is flowing. They, I mean, listen, they're having a fun time. Anybody ever had one of them parties? Wine is flowing. And then all of a sudden, he see a handwriting on the wall. Like something just start coming up and just start writing on the wall. Can you imagine? So the first thing that you're going to do is be like, okay, how much liquor did I have? I'm, I'm tripping right now. What, what, what happened? I, I, I see hair writing on the wall, you know? And so he's sitting there and he's watching it and his whole countenance starts to change so much so that others that are around him, they're looking because... Uh, uh, King Belshazzar sees uh, uh, that that his his this writing is coming on the wall, and he sees these words that's coming up. And I know he's tripping because he had a little bit of liquor in him, uh, and so you know your mind start playing tricks on you overall. And so the Bible describes it that his face turned pale and his thoughts were terrifying him. So he was just thinking like. What is going on? Now, I can't tell you what his innermost thoughts was, uh, but it confused him and concerned him enough that he was like, get somebody up in here that can interpret what that is on the wall. Guess I, I know, I know I had, 
you know, maybe that last one was a little too strong. I don't know what they put in it. Uh, I, but I see writing on the wall and I, I need somebody that can interpret that. That right there, I need somebody to do something about that. And so they brought in all types of people. They brought in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, the diviners. Uh, and it was like, I need somebody to tell me, whoever can tell me what that means. I'm going to give you a, you know, a linen, a purple. I'm going to put you on a gold necklace. I'm going I'm to I'm deck you out and I'm going to make you the number three in the land. This is what he's offering because he's like, yo, I don't know what's going on right now, but I need help. Somebody tell me what that is all about. And no one, no matter who it is that he brought in, whether it was the Chaldeans, whether it was the soothsayers, whether the sorcerers, all of those wise men, they couldn't read the writing and they couldn't tell him the interpretation. So that's when you find out who is good for nothing around you. I'm just saying, hallelujah, you got writing on the wall. You know, you've been tripping and everybody around you is tripping too, but at least they see it. And so he was terrified. King Belshazzar was very, very much ter um, terrified. And everybody else was kind of confused and perplexed about what was going on. But his wife, the queen, you know, she's like, what's going on in here? I need you to like get yourself together. We got somebody that can do all of this. We got somebody, hallelujah, I need y'all to hear this, right? We got somebody that can, you know, really give us a level of interpretation of what's going on. This happened to your father, and I need you to understand that the person that your father had, here's his reputation. Here's where I'm going with this, y'all. Right. So we get to verse number 12 and he says, your father, King over verse number 11 says, your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, made this person chief of the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans and the diviners. Why? Verse number 12, because an excellent spirit, knowledge and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles and solve problems were found in this Daniel whom the king named Belchazedar. Chesazar, I always confuse him, not confuse him, just can't pronounce him. Belchazedar. Now let Daniel be called and he will give the interpretation. So what was Daniel's descriptive to the queen. He was excellent in spirit. He had knowledge. He understood how to do what it is that they need. Now, I just want to pause right there just for a moment because I'm going somewhere. Listen, when you understand who it is that you are and what it is that you do, and you want to have the ability to earn greater income, the first thing you must do is work on you and work on you to be the best. Not that you can be. I know everybody be like, just be the best you that you can be. No, boo. We belong to God. We have got to be the best in the area in which we are gifted in. What separates you from everybody else? See, the best that you can be may, may not make you the best in who it is uh, that you are in the field uh, that you're in. And I'm just I'm just making it black and white. Can I just make it, uh, you know, clear? I want to make it plain. You know, I, I, I know uh, I've had this supposed to encourage you and all, all the good stuff. And I want to do that. Uh, but being the best that you can be may not cut it if you want to be excellent and earn additional income okay i just i just want to put that out there right so you must be excellent in the area in which you are anointed and or gifted this is why you must know who it is that you are that god said because then if you are walking in the will and the purpose of god then what will happen is you will study to be the best representative of god in that area in which he has custom designed for you to excel Oh, that, that, that get me excited right there, right? So, so, so I'm not just going to be, you know, the best that I could be as a financial planner. I'm going to nerd all the way out. And you tell me you got your Series 7. I'm going to be like, nope, I got my 763, 65, like the hell. I got da, 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 da. You know, I'm going to run it down because I want you to know that when I say a thing, I mean a thing and I know a thing. That when they start talking about reputations, and they start talking about black certified financial planners of which there is less than 1% in this entire country. I don't care where you go, what you do. Nicole B. Simpson's name is going to come up because she's been in this thing strong 19 years. That when other CFPs come into the marketplace, who trains them? I do. So I don't want anybody to think 
that I'm not the best in who it is that God has called for me to be. So what does that mean for you? I need you to understand that when you have recognized who it is that you are, you are going to be the most excellent at it. That's why I want to use the word most excellent. You are going to be most excellent at it and not based off of your definition, baby. It's got to be what the streets say about you. Well, what is the street saying? Even Jesus asked that question, well, you know, when they were talking about him healing the sick and raising the dead and doing all of these miracle signs and wonders. Eventually, he went up to his people and was like, yeah, well, you know, what do you say? What, what, what's the street saying? Like, I need the streets to be talking about you and your most excellent spirit. It's called referrals, y'all. It's word of mouth business. I'm going somewhere with this. I just want to set it up real slow, right? So if we understand, right? I need for you to know that when the conversation goes down in the area and the ability to earn income and increase your ability to earn, you should be on everybody's short list. What I mean by that is you should be in a position where when they start talking about this, because you so high up in dialogue and discussion, and I saw this a couple of months ago where a lot more people have started saying this, uh, right? Your name should have entered into places your feet have never been before. I remember in 2015, we were at, um, oh Lord God, let me get myself in trouble. Um, it was my internship in 2015. I forget the name of the church right now. Maybe, I mean, it's, it, they had the day of prayer or what have you. But I remember just being there. We prayed before the day of prayer. And so it was a level of prophecy. And I remember um, it being prophesied that, Nicole, your ceiling is about to be your new floor. You're about to rise up. Your ceiling is about to be your new floor. Where it is that God is taking you. Every time someone prophesies in some capacity or another, they talk about marketplace. That's where we're going tonight. You know, where is your marketplace or your ability to increase your level of earning so that you can really write your own ticket for what it is that you want? So I'm going to do the basics of it tonight. The reason why I had to lay all of that out, because this is really a work on you. It's a work on your identity. Listen, go back. Check out all of the things that are being said by identity, you know, get decennium decisions, get there to dream. We deal with identity all the way throughout all of that. You can go some ministry lessons or what have you. But once you've recognized who it is that you are, what it is that you're gifted to do, here's your practical. This is why I told y'all to bring paper and pen, right? What I need you to do, first thing, if I, actually, backtrack, rewind. Okay, this is, you need to do this. Not because this is the first thing that you need to do. You just need to do this to affirm who it is that you are. First thing that you do need to do is everybody should register your own name. Like I'm the I'm Nicole B. Simpson. Nobody else is going to own that name but me. Nicole B. Simpson, LLC. Heck, I got Harvest Wealth, LLC. I got Harvest Wealth Financial. I got Harvest Partners, um, Harvest um, Wealth. I think, um, you know, I know Jesse Mon has Harvest Wealth Media Group. Like we, I, I, I want you to understand what it is. But Nicole B. Simpson, I got that domain. First thing you should do is get the domain of who it is that you are. Second thing that you should do is you should envision what type of company, business, essence it is that you are. And you should name yourself. I think it's just important to do that. Put it out there. See, this is about writing a vision and making a plan. Once you do that, you need to get ownership of that as well. And now we're going to build into what it is that you've said. All right? So who you are and what it is that you do. Once we've defined that gift and that anointing, I want you to put it in the framework of your infrastructure. Now, I'm not just telling you this arbitrarily. I'm telling you some real legit stuff so that you'll know exactly what it is that you need to do. And if you set the infrastructure up and make the investment into yourself, see how all of this works out. But if you want the ability to earn money, then I'm trying to teach you exactly how to do that. Because the best way for you to earn money, if you are operating with the most excellent spirit in the most excellent way, doing what it is that God has called for you to do. If you set up infrastructure and conduits for it, then God will send the people. That's what he does. I'm trying to tell you that's what he does. But you can't send them nowhere if you ain't got nothing. All right? So get your name. I want www.nicolebsimpson.com. Everywhere you go, if I'm on Facebook, social media, you know, um, Instagram, everything, it's all continuous. That's all I have. Me and whatever the name of my business is, 
And I want you after you do yourself so that you have ownership of your name, wherever it goes, however it is you want to define it. The second thing that you want to do is see what branding that you want to build based off of whatever it is that you have. So you can see uh, based off of where it is that I am, we have Harvest Wealth. That has always been very important. Now, we might change the last wording on it. I have divisions, but the brand in this Harvest Wealth. Harvest Wealth Publishing, Harvest Wealth Financial, Harvest Wealth LLC. You understand what I'm going? And so you may have five talents, right? You just might have two. But even if you have the one, brand who it is you are and what it is that you want to do. So that's the, the second thing that you want to do. First one, get your name. Second thing is you want to identify where it is that you're going in terms of branding. You want to make sure that you do that. The third thing that you want to do is you want to establish the business called you. Pastors, preachers, entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, all of those individuals, um, you know, that singers, dancers, you know, writers, business owners that are entrepreneurs, consultants, you know, gurus, however it is that you are. I don't really care what the nature of your business is. The third thing that you want to do is you want to establish infrastructure for it. That's why just even if you don't know yet, you want to set yourself up as a business. So be it. We'll figure out what fills in the blank, but you should already know because I'm telling you identity and purpose is very important. Know who it is that God has called for you to be. But after you do that, right? After you set that up, you want to find out what type of business is best for me. Do you want to do that business on your own? Do you want to go into a partnership with somebody that you love, that you trust, that you care about? You know, do you want a separation between you and what it is, the entity that you're doing? Do you need to have those type of things? So you may have several options. I'm going to tell you some of them. In the nature of what it is that I do as a financial planner, I cannot separate myself from my business. I am so irate in that regard. However, based off of what it is that I do, you know, I am my business. And so I always have to have a sole proprietorship in my name, in my company, DBA, but any business that I do as a financial planner, it has to be a sole proprietorship. So I did a sole proprietorship DBA, meaning doing business as every other facet outside of selling what it is that I do in my, under the umbrella of investment can be protected away from me personally. So you have to decide the type of business that you are. Are you your business? Do you need that arm's length separation? I'm trying to help somebody. I'm trying to help somebody today. Hear me right now. So in my publishing company, right? So if I had a bad book or bad information and you bought it and you whatever wanted to sue me or you thought that I plagiarized your stuff, I get everything copyrighted. But let's just say that would be the um, case. If that is under... Harvest Wealth Publishing, LLC. What I've done is I've established a limited liability company, right? So it's an arm's length from who it is that I am as a person, meaning what is vulnerable is all of those entities that's associated with the publishing company. I have a limited liability that is limited to that business at hand, which means that business at hand should not be able, and she got a really, really, really good attorney, should not be able to filter over into my financial planning business. So you might hear somebody that goes bankrupt in one business, but you know that they're a millionaire. That limited liability is only limited to you to that particular endeavor right there. You have got to decide who are you going to be? Are you going to be a sole proprietorship? Are you going to be in partnership with somebody? Do you need a limited liability? Do you want an escort? Meaning there is, it has some aspects where the income is all about you and whoever the parties are, but you have a flow through of your income into the company. It's also giving you an extension of, you know, you in some capacity from your corporation or you should have a C Corp. Whichever one is best for you, you get to decide. I can tell you that without knowing your business specifically, most people fall under the umbrella or should fall under the umbrella in terms of protection and mechanism under LLC. It usually meets many of the needs for many people overall. And so you really want to make sure that you establish that. Now, you're not just doing that in name only. You're going to go we're in the state of New Jersey, whatever state that you're in. I told you I'm giving y'all practical information tonight. So I really want to make sure that I do that. You're going to go under NewJerseyBiz.com and then you're going to register your business. That's what you're going to do. And so it's new in WW. Somebody type this up. Um, HTTPS www.nj.gov forward slash NJ business. 
If you want to get information on starting it, you can put slash starting. So I'm going to repeat that one time. www.nj.gov forward slash NJ business forward slash starting. Remember, I keep telling everybody to do the research. I did the research for you because I love you and I just want you to be well. And I want all of us to be prosperous. And so I'm trying to help somebody understand how it is that we get to the ninth number in terms of increasing what it is that you earn, right? Because this is how you acquire wealth, okay? So once you do that, you want to be able to do the research there and it tells you everything that you need to know about starting a business right there on newjersey.gov, right? After you do that and you've decided what type of business that you want to do, you want to do getting registered. Same website. So if you're going through and you are very inquisitive, you have figured out the website. Let me tell you about a client that I had. I had this client. She made rum cakes. That's all she made. She was the rum cake lady. Right. And um, she had the anointing to do rum cakes. And she expanded that rum cake business to the point where she was shipping off and it was custom design. She had them in stores, but her ability to earn was in alignment with her oven. She was able to increase her level of earnings because she provided something that was unique and distinctive for her. And it was done with excellence. She didn't go and do carrot cake. She did rum cake. She didn't branch off and do strawberry shortcake. Her expertise was rum cake. And she stuck where it is that she was. And she found herself excelling in that particular area because she wanted to be the best person that when you thought about her or when you thought about rum cakes, you thought about her. See how when your name starts floating around in circles, you want to be at the top of the class in that area. This is what it is that we're talking about in order to allow your income to increase. People talk about the best. People only want the best. And then they got to figure out financially, can they afford to be in relationship with somebody that is determined to be the best? And most people get intimidated by that, not knowing whether or not they can or they cannot because they don't ask the questions. And so I'm going back to the book. You know, we understand what it is that our desires are. We understand that investing in who it is that we are and the desires that God has given to us. We are going to operate with the spirit of excellence. It may require additional education. It may require further apprenticeship, apprenticeship, which means you studying under somebody that is, you know, where it is that you're trying to go, gleaning from them and then improving where it is that you are, you know, to make sure that the student then becomes the teacher. One of the things that I appreciate the most about my mentor most about my mentor is that he realized when there was a transition that the student became the teacher and then he began to rely upon me for more innovative ways to do comprehensive financial planning, particularly into the church and the African-American community, because he was an old white man who knew the old methodology and way of doing things. I sponged off him because he offered it and then said, well, I need to know more to separate me because how do you be the best if there's somebody better than you? And honestly, I don't wanna be one of the best, I wanna be the best, right? So wherever it is your, your energy takes you, so be it. But you wanna make sure that you're understanding. So it's something that's new out, something that's innovative, something that you know helps you to be on top of what is going on in your said industry. These things are important. And so what the author is basically saying, going back to this, is that don't make it complicated. That's the other thing. Like. Have you ever heard of the saying that there are people that are jackers, jacks of all trades, masters of none, right? Jack of all trades, masters of none. And so you got your hands all over the world because you're a jack of all trades, but you have not mastered anything. One of the things that I love about education is because if you look at it from post-secondary um, um, education, you can look at where it is that people go in terms of um, college overall the levels that they go and what it is that they say so so when you and this is my opinion but supported by the thoughts of the majority in this one area when you get your bachelor's right bachelor's of arts bachelor's of science it doesn't matter it makes you a generalist 
I don't mean to offend anybody. It just makes you a generalist. You got some general knowledge and level of understanding about a couple of things here and there. You're a generalist. When you go to pursue your master, now you're honing in on something specific, more precise, right? So if you're if you're going through that and you acquire your master's degree, right? What you are now are what you now are is that you have accomplished a mastery level in that particular area. So my mastery level was in what? It was in divinity, in theology a master's of divinity, a master of the word of God. Some people go masters of, you know, um, applied science or masters of engineer, technical or God, oh, I'm saying or God, technical or, um, you know, computer engineering, mastering a particular area, which means you're not a generalist. You have a level of expertise in mastery or not, I don't use the word expertise, but you have a level of mastery in a thing that makes you more advanced or more skilled in a particular area that you have studied from an educational perspective. Couple that with experience, then you are really mastering a level. When you get to the point of doctorate, right, you are now a subject matter expert. That's what that is, meaning you write the rules of it. You are the ones that finds the innovative information. You are the contributor to that particular subject area, wherever it is. And so if I were to look at, at mine, my, my mastery level deals with traumatization, women that are incarcerated, Right. So sexual traumatization and women that are incarcerated, a pathway to a healing and wholeness. Ask me anything about that. I am a subject matter expert as far as education is concerned. And so when we look at that in wherever it is that you desire to earn, you want to make sure that you're the best. You don't want to be better than everybody else. You really want to be the best in your area. And it leads you or it ought to lead you to a place where your earnings potential is greater. The reason why I tell you about the conduit or the infrastructure of your own business is because it's not that it's impossible for you to do it through major corporations, but if you have your own infrastructure and the opportunity for the resources to come straight to you, all of the middlemen are cut out. So now let me give you an explanation of what it is that I'm talking about. I know she ain't going to leave the church, so I appreciate it. I'm going to use my sister as an example, right? So in the area of financial planning, comprehensive financial planning, you start talking about CFP, you start talking about investments, no matter where it is that you go. My name, eventually, when they start looking for ble on black CFPs, they're going to look for me, right? This just is what it is. But I work for myself. So that may take me um, in or out of contention. But when you start looking at practitioners, Nicole Simpson's name is going to come up. I work for myself, so I have that conduit. Sister Grandy doesn't work for herself. Right. She works in an industry in which she's still at the top level of her industry, not only because she's black and she's a woman. And she's been in there for an extended period of time, but because if you've heard about her, you know that she's excellent. So when the higher ups and the owners of these entities start talking, everybody knows Sanji on the street, meaning the street of the insurance world in her niche of what it is that she does. Because it even gets smaller at the top, right? So I need you to understand that no matter whether it be, you know, corporate America or not, excellence is excellence. When they called Daniel's name, when the queen was like, hey, don't worry about it. Your father had this guy named Daniel who was excellent with it in what it is that he did. And so that's how they were able to get the skill set of Daniel because his reputation had preceded him. So no matter what it is that you're doing, whatever area it is that you decide to go in, it does not matter. Be excellent in it through education, through, vocay, um, through experience, and through the knowledge of both practical and formal. See, because what makes Sister Grandy so great in what it is that she does has absolutely nothing to do with education. There are other people that have more degrees and credentials than she does, but she know her stuff. 
And so when you start going into the intricacies, I don't even look at a policy. Like, listen, ask me about an insurance policy. I can tell you everything from the front to the back, every single thing that's on that policy, whatever. I get my homeowner's insurance policy. I ain't need none of that. She know the bells and the whistles and new laws and the rules and the regulations come out. Give her a state. She can tell you what state it is or whatever. You know, that's because that separates her from everybody else that does the basics. If there's something new that's going on in your field, you ought to be the one of the first to know about it. People were laughing when this whole situation came down. Not laughing because actually it was distress. Not laughing. I'm going to end on this note. But when the whole situation with COVID came down, right? By the nature of who it is that I was, one of the first things that I did was to research everything that the government said that they were anticipating doing. And I journeyed with individuals so that they would be in the front line. Now, the truth of the matter is, I'm telling my business, it's okay. I, 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 I tend to, you know, don't mind being exposed, especially if it's going to help somebody. You look at all of the TV um, narrative, all the media narrative about everything. There's not one thing, and my assistant is probably on, there's not one thing on here that um, cannot be validated or affirmed by my assistant. I apply for everything. I'm a small business owner, COVID-19 or whatever, because I had did the research, I understood it, I stayed in line, I made sure the PPP, the EIDL, you know, everything for what, those individuals that were gig workers that had to go for unemployment, that I began to advise individuals, you file for unemployment, no, it does not make sense for you, this makes total sense for you, you should be able to get the PUA as well. Why? Because if you're an expert in your field and you operate with the spirit of excellence, not only are you helping those that are directly connected and or associated with you increasing your level of income guess what happens everybody else goes and it turns around and be like oh no you know who helped me that cfp over there her name is dr nicole b simpson and everything that i needed she not only was able to acquire it for herself but she told me how i could get it for myself too there's something to be said about having your own infrastructure so that you are not only capable of operating with a spirit of excellence in whatever it is that you say, think, and or do, but that you can increase your income over time. Now, I'm going to pause here tonight, and we're going to pick this back up again on next week. But the thing that I want you to know, and I hope that you do everything that I told you to do, because when I wrote Dead a Dream, it was aspirational, right? It was aspirational. So now I'm at the place where I can tell you that 10 years down the road, you'll thank the Reverend Dr. Nicole B. Simpson for what it is that she's selling. But I'm telling you to do all of those things because we're going to pick up where it is that we're leaving off tonight because you want to ensure if your desire is to have increased wealth, it is slow and steady that gets you there. Then you start doing things on a larger and more broader scale. I'm going to help you. If it's not already established, I'm going to help you set up your infrastructure because you want to earn more. Now, this is with the presumption. This is with the presumption. This is with the presumption that pastor and doctor have not been wasting our times teaching you all that we taught you on last year. Amen. Amen. Come on, y'all. Let's have a quick word of prayer. And then hopefully you guys will jump back on at 815 for our nightly prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you on tonight for not only your loving kindness, but your tender mercies and your grace. We thank you, God, because I know that you are doing amazing things in the house called Micah, Lord God, the house where dreams really do come true. Lord God, you have given us uh, the desire, Lord God, to operate with a spirit of excellence, but you have already told us that we're pioneers and trailblazers. You give us insider intel so that we would have the ability, the opportunity, oh God, to be creative and innovative in this period of time. So God, with the assignment that has been given to your sons and your daughters, it is my prayer that as they continue to live a lifestyle of obedience, uh, that we would be able, Lord God, to set up what is necessary so that we have the ability to earn. That requires us doing work on us and ensuring that we are where it is you have purpose for us to be. And once we can confirm that, Lord 
oh God. We are showing our level of faith by doing the practical and the tangible things essential for our growth and our development overall. So I pray, Lord God, that they all would not only register their names, but they would determine what type of entity that is going to define their brand and that they would put that in the level of infrastructure, i.e. of a business. And that if they should need help one from another, Lord God, because there are so many of us with gifts and anointing in our own establishment that we would bounce off of each other to ensure that we're in a great place. I thank you, Lord God, for every person that has the commitment and the desire, Lord God, to do what is being spoken over their lives even now. In this and in all things, we give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. God bless you. I thank God for all of you that are on with us on tonight for our Bible study. Week number 16 is in the books. Week number 17, we're going to pick up where it is that we left off at because I think that this is important. And I know that it's specific for Micah 7 Ministries. There are too many anointed, gifted creative, soon to be wealthy people in Micah. Wealth is not defined by the amount of money that you have, but with all of the principles of financial integrity and success, we all have the opportunity to have the fulfillment of John 3 and 2. I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. God bless you. Good night. I love you. I will see you soon. Bye-bye.